Welcome to the Crack On Podcast, hosted by me, John Saunders. Crack On! Hey guys, welcome to another edition of Crack On, the Crack On Podcast. And today, uh, again, I'm very lucky to have a good friend of mine, top bloke, um, literally the king of cricket, in my opinion. Um, got his own company just launched, which we'll talk about, Bat Set Cricket. Uh, loves always uh, always been in the sales world uh, and just like I said an all-round top crack on guy uh, Dave Kirtley hello there bud how are you doing I'm good mate that's a uh, that's an introduction to live up to so uh, oh, yeah no I'll pressure you, we only start high and then we'll see where the next sort of 40 <laughs> but uh, yeah how's tricks with you mate how's lockdown two or soon to be lockdown three uh, um I think yeah I mean we're living in Cardiff we're I think we've gone to the real frustration point now. Um, we had new lockdown measures yesterday, um, which looks like there's no alcohol to be sold at all in bars and restaurants for the next yeah. three or four weeks. No, next two weeks. Um, and the bars and restaurants have to shut at 6 p.m. So I think it's just gone past, you know, they talk about this COVID fatigue and people being really frustrated with it. And I think I, I've just got a feeling this is probably the tipping point for everyone. Um, and it's yeah, going to be, you know, it's yeah, not any really tough yeah, on. We're, we're going to go in. We spoke a bit offline that, you know, yeah. you had last night and an experience out in Cardiff, and, and, and we'll run through that in a sec because it's, uh, it sounded like a nice experience. Um, but yeah, no, I think it's a, it's a double barrel whack, you know, smack because I mean the leisure industry generally, yes, has had an absolute kick. But I mean, as we spoke about again offline, that you know, there's like brewers and people like that that have literally just got themselves geared up for Christmas and they're going to have to pour it down the drain, which is a real sad state of affairs, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I know I feel for them. And um, yeah, I mean, there's lots of good independent places that are, they're going to suffer. Um, yeah. yeah. And just working out a way to pull through, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But I think, you know, the, you know, ultimately I was really chuffed uh, that again, I reached out to you, you reached out to me to, to, to come on to the, the podcast because there's loads of things we can pull, pull, and loads of questions I've got to sort of uh, ask you. And but the first one I, I put on that, that when I sent a bit of a bio a, a list to you. So what is crack on? So what is crack on to you, and what does it mean to you? I think it's. I think what I've you know worked out. I think through all either working career or helping out with the cricket club and all that sort of stuff. It's it, it's, it's probably cracking on. It's just working out what the barriers are, um, and just. You know what can you do to batter them down and, and sometimes you can break them down and sometimes they're not and i think you just got to be realistic in in what you can do and i know you know you've done a you, you've done an iron man how many how many iron men have you done now i've only done the one but i'm on my i would have done the last i would have done wales last year if it wasn't cancelled so yeah I've, we've gone i'm on next year's now instead so uh yeah i'm, I'm looking forward to that so I think that, I mean, I think that's an example that, you know, you've got to have this sort of perfect moment where your kids have got to be the right age. You've got to have the support from the family. You've got to be able to, the all that time you invest into it. And I think that's probably an extreme version of, you know, what are those obstacles that you need to break down in order to do stuff. Um, and I think once you've worked out, you know, why not, once you've worked out what the why nots are, can you get rid of those why nots and turn them into, well, yeah, we can do it. And um, whether that's support from the family, support from your mates, it's getting up early, whatever it is. For me, it's just working out what the bar what's going to stop you doing this. And if you know what's going to stop you doing this, can you get rid of those barriers? And then, as you say, sort of crack on using your words. Yeah, yeah. Well, I like that. We're going to use that word quite often, mate, during it. But <laughs> I mean, on that note, give us a bit of a give the give the audience a bit of a background and Dave Curtly then talk us through. Uh, I see we went to the same university, which is yeah. you know, which is obviously you you know we we start off on the right too, mate. So yeah, give us a bit of history on on the, on Dave Curtly. So, yeah, I mean, I moved to Cardiff in 96. So um, UIC, it just changed, changed from Cardiff Institute of Higher Education to UIC. So that was 1996. I came up there, did sports science degree. Um, and then just, I, I suppose, just sort of floundered around for a little bit. I was doing a, I was doing a master's. I was doing um, bits and pieces jobs. I was working in fitness first. Yeah. Um, and then I started working for Posturite. Um which you know sadly I got made redundant from in the in the summer but I worked for them for the best part of 20 years yeah. and that was yeah. really huh yeah no I know it's uh yeah it's one of those things and I know we're going to come on to it but it's yeah 
so 20 years i mean we started there was only 12 of us when we first started i mean just to put it in perspective our, our first sales meeting um our sale you know our, our, our ceo owner at the time says right we're going to do this email thing <laughs> and like and there was like there was about six of us sat around the table and we thought oh i've heard about this it's supposed to be really good yeah um and we just, you know, you, you start a company. It wasn't quite from scratch, but we certainly took it from the early days when I think there was only 12 of us when we first started. And then when I finished in the in the summer, there's, I think, just over 200 staff. So yeah, um, that's been a lot of my stuff on the corporate side. But then, you know, I've been involved with Cardiff Cricket Club for, again, for the best part of 20 years. I'm chairman there now. And again, amazing. seeing that's that grow. I mean, to be chairman, that's an amazing feat, mate. It's, um, yeah, it's... It, it, it's a, I mean, particularly this summer, I think it's been really challenging what you can and can't do. Um, and again, I think those, those are the ones, you know, when you put barriers up that actually you can't do certain things and, yeah. you know, you they're the barriers. You can't still play a little bit. I'd love to play a bit more. Um, <laughs> ironically, the chairman stuff gets it's in the way. We'll come to where, where I live now and the people we mutually know in a sec, but I've, I've probably played the most cricket I've ever played, right? Um, last season, I played the most cricket, and I, I tell you what, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Like twice yeah. a week, I've never played twice a week, and you know, like my boys playing, I've loved my cricket this season. And uh, I've got some. Sometimes I've got a really good story when I played against you for the first time. Actually, I'll come to that in a second. But <laughs> I bet it's been tougher kind of cricket, huh? Yeah, I think in hindsight, looking at all the sports, I think cricket got. Yeah, looking back at it, I think we got a really good deal. Um, yeah, you know, so. we managed to get, you know, most clubs played into well into September. Yeah. Um, so certainly into the third week of September. So we pretty much had all of July, all of August and most of September playing. You know, when you look at, um, I think amateur rugby in England has been cancelled yeah, for the season. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing in England for rugby at all. Um, I'm not sure what they're doing with Welsh club rugby at the moment. I don't think they formally called it off, um, but I can't see any of that happening. So I think from a from a sporting perspective, I think cricket probably got it OK. And again, looking forward, by the time the vaccination's out and summer's out, um, I think we're going to have pretty much a full season um, when it comes to it in sort of April, May. So, yeah, it's been um, it's been an interesting time. But, yeah, it's, it's just, work, again, working out what you can and can't do, I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, I mean, talk us through... Like I know you through the cricket. That's how we sort of uh, met each other. And talk us through what kind of, you know, talk us through your cricket career and, and talk us through what you've done within that. Okay, so um, I mean, I grew up in Sussex. Um, yeah. So yeah, not too far Great from where you are now. County, I tell you what. Um, and yeah, I played a bit of sort of Sussex under 19s and Sussex second 11. And that was, yeah, that was, that was, I suppose challenging, really challenging cricket. I think my, my first second eleven game was against Surrey seconds, yeah. um, and playing against Ben Holyoke, um, yeah, 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 David yeah, yeah. Ward, yeah. Um, yeah. David Ward, who was probably hit the ball harder than anyone I've ever known hit the ball. And you know, I was coming in there as sort of 18, 19 year old playing second eleven cricket. And I think I was, I, th I think I was sub or reserve or twelfth man or whatever, and I came yeah. on. And they just put me at point to David Ward, who just hit the ball harder than anyone I've ever known. Um, and I was, yeah, so I was sort of fresh out of uh, fresh out of junior cricket playing this stuff. And um, just probably, I think probably just felt a bit out of my depth then, but came up to Uick. We played a lot of cricket at Uick and that stage, it was very much student led. So it's completely different to what it is now. We had to drive ourselves to games. We had to yeah. coach ourselves. We had to sort everything else out ourselves. So it was so student led. Yeah. Um, but again, we had a pretty times, successful. Good times. They were brilliant. That yeah, they were. I loved it. Was it. I loved such, it. it was such a good time that um, you're just all in it together. And it, yeah, yeah, again, yeah, you talk to the students I mean, about it now. You're right, but the guys said, I mean, they've got it good now, haven't they? I mean, you know, they have got it good. I mean, obviously, this uh, elite sport or high high level sport take away the barriers, take away the boundaries. But actually, part and parcel of it is back in the day when we played was that was it, wasn't it? Traveling the games together and mixing in and you know i thought it was I, I loved that part of it it was it was who who who, who had the um but first of all who could drive yeah <laughs> then who was old enough to drive a minibus then who had the least amount of points yeah and yeah <laughs> and it was yeah it was just different times um, yeah, so but I, you know i think that the, as you said different. the students now have got it they've got it um they got it landed particularly that elite program we've got going on at cardiff with the ucce um 
you know, they're training twice a week. They've got their conditioning. Um, I think that's once or twice a week. And um, I'd, have, I'd have loved to have been part of that. That would have been. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I suppose for two different reasons. I mean, one of the questions on that, one of the bits on that, they have got it that way now. But don't you feel that there's, there's an element of fun taken away from that now? You know, like you look at the England, I look at England cricket on, on the weekend and don't get me wrong, I love that team they put out against 2020. I thought that team was a, a great team. You know, I thought they were going to, they, they, they did in the end beat South Africa yeah. again. But, you know, that elite side of it and the way that Wales play their rugby and it's all very, it's, you know, the banter, I don't know, it, it might just be me, but has the fun gone out of it? You know what I mean? It's interesting because, I mean, Diego Maradona, he, he passed away this week. And um yeah, very sad. I was chat. I can't remember who I was chatting to about it, but we were thinking that there's certain mavericks in the game, and he was he was just one of those guys. Um, and would would he, in the current elite setup that we have, survive an elite sport? So if someone turned up to warm up with their boots untied, with different kit on, wouldn't join up in the group warm up, just juggled a ball on the side, yeah. would they actually be allowed through the system now? And I I don't know. I, I think there's a few mavericks really, mate, really good probably question. going out really of the sport. Question. Um, you know, Kevin Peterson was probably the standout one in um, in cricket. Joffre is a little bit like that, I think, at the minute. Um, yeah. I mean, and I think through. Stokes, right? I mean, I've got a story about Ben Stokes, so I will put it in there now because it's a good one. But Ben Stokes, obviously, when he got done in Bristol, yeah, and he got he got caught fighting. I mean, I'll give you when I had ten mil lane, and um, he was playing four day. He, it was a four day game, and then they had a one day one day at the end of it. So it was five days he was in Cardiff, right? <laughs> so we opened Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday till six in the morning. He was there till six in the morning every day, right? He was the last person we asked to leave, but then he went and scored a th- two tons in both innings, and he and he yeah. got a fiver in in the in the one day. It was unbelievable, and I just thought, fair play, mate. You are for me an absolute. This was before he went and won the World Cup and did the yeah. ashes and everything he did a few seasons ago. But I just thought from that point, when I'm kicking him out and Collingworth out at the bar at six in the morning, uh, I just thought um, you, you for me have just stepped up a level, you know? Um, yeah, and I, I don't know if that goes on. I mean, it'd be good for you to get some, you know, some of the, I suppose, recent professional players on. But, you know, I don't know if that stuff still goes on quite as much. Um, well, I mean, I can tell you straight, it doesn't. But I, I, when I left Tiger Tiger, last time we left Tiger Tiger, the England team stayed over the road. Yeah, uh, and Joe Root, um, about four of them sneaked, sneaked in, had a beer. I mean, Joe Root, I think, is a top boy. Stokes was one of them as well. There's about <laughs> four of them came out. Burstow was one of them. Um, yeah. And they came out for beers, but very, not like, you know, it wasn't like exuberant, but they were out having beers, which was good. But I don't think it does happen so much, does it, you know? No, I, 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 I don't know. And, and, and as I said, I don't think, I'm not sure those Mavericks, I think, yeah, I I'm not sure they'd survive in the current sort of elite system. And um, yeah, it's an interesting one, but there's got to be space for them because I think they're the entertainers of the game. They're, they're the ones that keep the crowds coming back. And, and I think through, you know, good management and understanding what those players need, you know, that's what, that, that's what the art of coaching is about. What, what, what those player, what that player needs at that given moment in time. Sometimes they need a bit of, a bit more rope. Sometimes they need reining in a little bit, but um, I think if you squash all that potential all in one, you're not going to get the best out of them. And and, and perhaps that's, that's what they did well in, with Ben Stokes and, yeah, and various yeah, yeah. others. Well, they must have <laughs> did well. Who's the, on that note then, who's the best coach in your opinion that does that well? And who's the best coach out there at the moment that allows them that rope? And, the, um, you know, it doesn't need to be cricket in any sport really, but who's out there at the moment that does that from a, from a sporting point of view? I mean, I growing up at Sussex, you, you know, you saw what Peter Moore's, was like, and and I know, you know, KP hasn't got a huge amount of time for him. Um, yeah. I think probably because he, because Pete probably challenged him a little bit more. So yeah. actually, do you know what? You average 55, a player of your ability should be averaging 65, 70. And I think he yeah. probably pushed him and challenged more than KP wanted. But um, you, you, you listen and hear what um, other players around have, have worked with him over the years. And they've said, you know, hands down, he's one of the best coaches around, I think. Matt Maynard, um, you know, I've been really lucky. He played club cricket at Cardiff in 2011 and I had a chance to play with him. Um, mm. And actually the way he made us feel as players, and I know, you know, he's had the same at Glamorgan, but the way, the way he can make you feel as a, as a player, he made, he made you feel 10 feet tall. Yeah, yeah, 
Um, you know, when he said, well done, you were just like, Phew, you know, I've got yeah, this. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I bet, I bet. Um, and I think there's certain elements of, you know, you start pulling together each parts of different coaches. And I think you, you, you get an excellent one, but I think they all do it in their different way. But probably Pete and Matt, for me, um, probably stand out more than others. Yeah, amazing. And then, and then in your career then, I mean, we, we're going to get to that Welsh cap and uh, how you got there. I mean, obviously you played for Cardiff majority majority of your, your career. Yeah, yeah. So I've only played at two clubs. So I played at Eastbourne um, up until I was about twenty, and then from Cardiff. Then I had, actually had one one season at Ammerford in West Wales. Oh, brilliant! Um, but that was when I was, my, I think, my first year at Uix. So I played about four or five games there. Um, but then since there, it's just been Cardiff through and through. Cracking! Well, I, I can vouch for a good Eastbourne now because I played there. Well, their first of a, a, a really good standard, and I've played against Cardiff on a number of occasions, and I can vouch how good they are as well compared to. The teams I've played for, but so talk me through your Welsh cap. How you got to that point? Because that that's the you know for me and anyone that's listening, that's the elite. You know, playing for your nation, that must have been something special, mate. Yeah, I think I, I didn't. I don't think I quite realised. I don't think I quite realised it at the time. And and looking back, you know, it's certainly one regret I've got. I didn't play for Wales more. Yeah. Um, and it's it's a really it's an interesting setup. So when I. Probably when I played at my best, probably 10, yeah, maybe 10, 15 years ago, the the Wales county side was made up of Glamorgan second 11. So the idea was to give those Glamorgan second 11 players more cricket. Um, yeah. So for the club player like um, uh, myself and, you know, various other people around, we didn't really get an opportunity because it was full of, you know, the likes of, you know, at the time it was like Gareth Rees, um, you know, Wally was playing first team, but it was made up of those guys like Ryan Watkins, Gareth Reese. Those guys were playing, you know, Wales minor counties at the time. Um, yeah. And clubbies didn't really get a look in. And then they moved that away, turned it into more a sort of almost like a Glamorgan Academy side um, with a few older players mucked in there as well. So it was, you know, the game I played in, probably the three senior players were myself, Darren Thomas and Anira Norman. Um, mm-hmm. And I wish I'd have played more. Um, but, it, you know, it was, I was going to say... It, it's so amateur in the way that, you know, you, ha- you have to take days off work to play for them, you know, yeah. t- two, three day games. So you have to take every Monday off, probably take Tuesday off as well. Um, and actually when you're working full time, I think my daughter had just been born when I played there as well. So yeah. it was full on with work. It was full on with home and actually to, to take time away from the family and time off work um, wasn't really an option at the time, but looking back on it, I wish, I wish I'd done it. I wish I'd made those sacrifices because I think, one I really enjoyed playing with Darren Thomas um, yeah. and it was the first time I'd um, played alongside him I played against him for years um, and we'd always locked horns and we we're both pretty competitive and probably I don't know if you ever speak to Darren we probably didn't see eye to eye yeah yeah well hey, mate, I, you know I think that's always a that's a point in my opinion you've got to have you've got to have that competitive edge you know you're a competitive guy aren't you you know and yeah um, competitive people in the you know red-blooded you know, cricket players together, you're going to have that sort of competition. I bet that fueled competition for you, didn't it? Yeah, it did, yeah. And then actually playing alongside him. He, I mean, he's a fantastic coach. Um, yeah. I I really enjoyed, you know, it was only, I think we only played two or three days down in Devon, but I, I yeah, I just think, you know, he's, I'd love to see him have a great future at uh, one of the counties. Um, yeah. I think he's, I think he's got a huge amount to offer in terms of experience. You know, he was, England A, he played in so many years for Glamorgan. I don't know how many hundreds of wickets he got. You know, he had a couple of years down at Essex as well. Yeah. Um, and I just really enjoyed playing alongside him. Um, and I just thought what he was offering and what he offers to the younger players, you know, bear in mind a lot of them are sort of 17, 18, 19 years old. Yeah. Um, to have someone of that experience in the changing room with them, to guide them through, to actually say, do you know what, if you want to play professional cricket, these are the sacrifices you have to make. This is what you need to do to get there. Um yeah, I, I, I wish I played a bit more. You know, I, I probably, at my best, I don't think I play, I, the setup wasn't there to play um, more Welsh cricket. But it's certainly when I look back at my cricket career, and I've been proud of so many things, I wish yeah. I'd played a bit more at the time. Yeah, and, and do you know what? You say that, and I think I, I think all of us now, when we get to that age of 40 plus, you, you do look back and you do reflect. And, uh, you know, yeah, there's opportunities that, that have gone by. I think, you know, anyone that's sat there now, you know, you, you, let's say, you know, because you'd have had a lot, you'll have a lot of talented young young sportsmen coming through Cardiff. I've, I've been lucky enough, my son was involved in that when I was back in Cardiff a few years ago, and 
I know how, how hard those coaches sort of, uh, how much effort they put in, but also how good that talent is in Cardiff. What, what would you, what would your advice be for a 16, 17 year old kid that's coming through that's got the talent, but um, you know, just, just, you know, what would your advice be to that person if, uh, from an international point of view and from playing, getting to that high standard? Um, I think, I think some of those young kids have got it. I think they're in a really difficult position. So, you know, your example there, a 16 year old, he's probably got, <clears throat> if he's any good and he's, yeah. he's on the sort of cusp of that professional, he's probably got five coaches that he's working with, particularly in, um, in Cardiff. He might have his club coach. He'll have his County coach. He'll have his Wales coach. He might have a Academy coach and he might be oh. playing some Glamorgan seconds and perhaps some Wales um, County stuff as well. Yeah. So you could have six coaches. And I think the best, probably the best young players are the ones that are able to filter out um, the information that they're being given and work out what works for them. Yeah. And sadly, I've seen a few young players who've been in that position where they've got probably six or seven people giving them opinion, plus everyone else on the outside giving them opinion as well. Yeah. And all of a sudden their head gets muddled. They can't work out what they want to do. They change their run up. They hold the ball differently. They change their game completely because they've got so many different, um, I suppose, inputs into their coaching um yeah. and so what i've tried to do with cardiff if we've got you know when we have those promising juniors is 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 speaking to them and speaking to rich armand at glamorgan say right who's their main coach um who's the one who's gonna shape this player and actually if it's they could say it's rich armand they could say it's darren thomas it could be uh, brad wadlam it could be anyone yeah and then as a coach group who's working with that players I think we should be filtering stuff through to their main coach. So if I pick up on something, one of our junior players is turning up late or he's throwing his wicket away or whatever it is, I can deal with it on a club perspective, but actually I need to filter that through to Rich Armand, who's managing, essentially managing his pathway, his cricketing career. Yeah. Um, and that for me would be the main thing. Identify who your main coach is and, and, and try and, yeah, the difficulty is trying to filter out all that information that you get given by everyone who means well. But, you know, by meaning well, they can just confuse these young players. And it's a hard enough time as it is, you know, 16 yeah, years yeah. old when you're playing adult think, cricket. It's horrible. That's great advice, full stop. I think that, I mean, I look at these, I mean, I, I you know, rugby is obviously on the, on, the, on the TV at the moment. But I looked at the French uh, game on the weekend against Italy. And, you know, I, count, I counted 12 coaches or, you know, 12 support staff. Yeah. I just thought to myself, if I was a player in that environment, I don't get me wrong. There's an argument that yes, there's a you know any any sort of you can get an inch in that in that elite sport. Yes, an inch is a long way. But twelve yeah. people will have their input on on an outcome of a game. And I just thought to myself, well, back in our day, you'd have well, you'd have one coach if that <laughs> with the rubber dub man or whatever, you know. And you know, ultimately, I, 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 I'm you know that that's where the biggest shift in sport has happened, isn't it? I mean, that coaching level. And I agree with you with regards to, you know, it's hard when you've got six influences on your mm. game. You know, if anything, I think if you can, it's a tough place to steer, isn't it? I think for the young players, I think, yeah, the ones that get it right and the older players, they sort of filter in that information and they either let it pass through them or they actually take it on board. Um, but listen, there's so many. Um, but I mean, coming to your point, you know, with those, those national coaches who've got a network of maybe 12, 15 support, you know, if they've got their own thing, you know, so it might be with the, you know, with England cricket, it's, you know, your wicket keeping coach, your fielding coach, your bowling coach, your um, batting coach. You might have a couple others that are working around there. Yeah. And as long as people don't get involved too much in other people's area, I think it works. It's probably yeah, when your fielding coach yeah. starts getting involved with your batting stuff, you're probably going to have problems. Yeah, yeah, totally. I think he, it was interesting you mentioned Matt, Matt Maynard. I mean, what a legend in his own right. I was lucky enough to play against him against St. Faggins um, and Tom, you know, back, yeah. back in that day where when they played in the club together. And I mean, what an awesome, like in me, I was in awe, you know, I mean, that game, and I come back to a game we played actually. And this is where, this is where one of the stories I sent you previously that you might not, you won't remember this, but I do. I mean, Kossi Kodak, I used to play with Kossi Kodak and we got promoted to the Premier, yeah? You'd been uh, uh, in the Premier for, and we, we were playing Cardiff at home and it was our second game of the season. And I'd been chosen for the first against Cardiff. And I remember rocking up, and I didn't know you at this time at all. I hadn't even gone to university, I don't think, at this point. Or I had been. I was in uni or whatever it was. And I came back, and I'd rocked up. And all I saw was all the Cardiff team. You were batting against, you know, you were practicing. 
And like us, I was sat there going, what the heck's going on here? I've never seen this before. <laughs> for a game. And, and it was a welcome to the premiership, right? So yeah. we, got, we ended up batting first, I think, down the slope, small boundary. I think we got about 290, 300. We were chuffed the beans. You got it in 28 overs and you smacked 142. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> welcome to the Premiership. Hello, my name's Dave Kirtley. <laughs> um, and that was my introduction to, to meeting you and actually just thinking, fair play, these are a good team at this point in bat, you know? Um, but yeah, you probably can't, you can't remember, but it stays in my mind. I, know, I, I remember we, we, uh, we did play against you once. Times. We did play against you once. I think we got 300 odd. And um, you had Will Bragg, and Brad Wadlam? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't playing at that point. I was, uh, yeah, but we, yeah, yeah, we did. Have Brad no, we, we got something like 340. And we right. thought, do you know what? The, our biggest score ever. A couple of people got hundreds. And then I think Will Bragg got 190. Wow. And Brad got 95. They put on a stand of something like 300. And I'm there as captain. I'm like, I, I can't do anything about this. These guys are just smoking it everywhere. I move a fielder, they put it where... And um, I mean, we, yeah, it ended up being a draw, but it was, uh, yeah, uh, there was one point I was like, there's no way you can get 340 and lose this. No, 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 mate. If you get 340 and lose it, you ain't going back to the club. <laughs> but, I mean, you mentioned you were captain and, and talk us through, I mean, one thing I remember of you being captain and a, and a great leader. Um, what was, you know, what were the, what was it like being a captain of that sort of team? Because it was, it was high level on club cricket. It was as high as you could get in, in South Wales. So what was it like... Uh, sort of being a, a captain in that environment? I think, I mean, I did it for, I think, seven years in all. Um, and, I, you know, those years, you know, those years that you win it, they're the easy ones. You know, yeah. that's, I suppose, they're the ones you remember. And actually, you've got everyone gelling and working in the right direction and you know what's going on and people are practising well and all that. I suppose it was the it was the other years in between that being, I think, being a captain in any, being a club captain in any amateur sport is really hard work. Yeah. Um, I take my hat off to way, anyone who does it. What, what do you mean? What are the challenges within that? It's just you, the nice, the nice stuff is actually playing yeah. and doing yeah. the stuff on the field. It's all the other stuff, which uh, you know, it's organising practice, it's taking the sessions, it's doing the selection, it's it's everything, it's everything. And you know, whether it's you know, depending how much support you've got from the club, um, arranging teas, collecting match fees. Um, I just just everything that goes with it, it's it, it can become all consuming. And I get the people who sort of do it for a couple of years and just want to go back playing. Um I just yeah, I just I suppose with that on that on that question then on that on that point, grassroots cricket, cricket generally, participation cricket, sport generally. I mean, that is probably would you agree that that's that's the biggest reason why people probably exit out of it is because and that and, and, and participation level numbers wise, they, what, what are they like in Wales at the moment? I don't know enough about that. But are they are they growing? Are they? I know I know Cardiff Cricket Club is is a, is a yeah. We're, we're growing. I think the you know they've got a the couple of junior really? junior schemes going well. Um, so they've got new All Stars and Dynamos, which is getting younger kids into the game, which I think is great. Um, you were involved in that, weren't you? Yeah. So we've I mean we've done a lot in uh, Cardiff. So we've got about hundred. I think we had about hundred. 20 um yeah, the all-stars scheme which is um which is a crazy amount of kids to control at one time <laughs> yeah. um especially like i got three but, years too. imagine having that many running around you know oh man it's uh yeah herding cats but yeah, I, yeah, I, I think for me i think cricket needs to look at um there's two really big risk groups that are dropping out of cricket one is um teenagers yeah. who now have more pressure on them for exams. Whereas, you know, you and I did GCSEs, you studied for three, uh, sorry, you studied for two years. Yeah. Maybe you worked really hard for about three or four weeks of those two yeah, years. Yeah, totally. And then you had a block of exams and that was done. Now it's completely different. They've got modules and they've got all that sort of stuff. So one is um, you've got teenagers dropping out of the game and you've got young dads. Now the pressure on young dads is different now than it's ever been before, I think. You know, they're expected yeah. to be present more than they ever have. Yeah. Um, and I think cricket, for me, needs to take a look at the game as a whole. Actually, what, what can we do to keep those um, people in the game? Um, and I don't think we should be going to 20 over cricket, but actually reducing it to 40 over cricket rather than 50 over cricket, I think, is, is the way. Because actually, you free up people's mornings. You know, yeah. you can then go and play. Jack can go and play. He's done his revision in the morning. He's done three hours revision in the morning. Yeah. 
We can go and play in the afternoon. But if you're playing 50 over... If I can get him after over an hour, I'd be happy. <laughs> for him at the moment. Be like, uh, but I agree. I think I, I agree with it. The shorter... And we play, we're lucky we play 40 overs down here. And, um, you know, 40 overs for that sort of Sunday, Saturday games, I think work really well for that reason. Yeah. You know? And we see it up here. People want to say, well, actually, you know, we're going to be playing Premier League cricket, which is 50 over cricket. So we have to play 50 over cricket. And you just think you're not going to be playing any cricket because people are dropping out. Yeah, You've exactly. got to have a look at the bigger picture. Yeah. And, that, and I bet that, I mean, down here, you you lived in Sussex. It's, it's thriving. Yeah. Cricket mm. down here, the biggest change for me is coming down. The weather obviously is the one big one. Right. I mean, I, I'll give you an example. When we play midweek with a, with a, with a with, with club, one season in club, I played six games, right? The whole season. And that wasn't through lack of availability. That was just the rain. And last yeah. year, I missed one game was rained off. You know, one game. Yeah. Unbelievable difference, the weather. <laughs> the Sunshine Coast. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but no, I agree with you. And there is a serious point with that, you know, that ultimately there is a, there is a big, you know, there's a big issue creeping up and it's uh in the next five years it's going to be tough you can already see cricket clubs rugby clubs go into the wall already you know and that's it's a tough place to be what would you do to you know what would you what do you think needs to happen within that you said the shorter 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 sort of shorter format of the game you think that's you know what else what else could uh, no actually i think it links into what i said earlier is it links into what i said earlier with you know <clears throat> what are these obstacles that people are dropping out that, what what is the problem? Why are people dropping out the game? And what can we do to, you know, present the game in a better format? And for me, I think one is the clubs need to have a holistic approach to cricket. Yeah. Um, not what's best for them and their club and their players. What's the best for cricket as a whole? And I, you know, sadly, I see at AGMs that, you know, clubs and players are voting for what they want to do rather than what's best for the game. And I think if you look after the game as a whole, then your club's going to get looked after. Um, and I think any just again working out what those barriers are. What are people saying? What the what what the players saying? The players want to play a shorter form of cricket. Yeah. Um, so I think you know you just got to listen to what people want, um, and again just break down those barriers to it. It's it, it's not. I don't think it's rocket science. I think there's a problem with facilities um, yeah. in Wales, and that there's not enough. Um, and that's something that cricket Wales and Glamorgan have to tackle because it's it's a real problem. You've got two venues in Cardiff. Um, and then you're up in Evervale, which is, you know, even on a good run, it's 40 minute drive yeah, to get easy, to up to Evervale. I, I agree with you on that. I think, uh, again, looking at the facilities down here, I'm, I'm quite lucky that I've been able to, to look at both. And, you know, the facilities down here are amazing. I mean, yeah. um, I just think every club's got something to offer. Um, and you can go to the indoor, outdoor, wherever you want. And I think it's, uh, you're right. I think it's a real issue that I think Glamorgan generally, and like you said, uh, cricket Wales have to sort of tackle pretty quickly because if they don't, like you say, there won't be any cricket, you know, in years to come. And that's such a sad place to be if we don't sort it, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I've just seen the, the plans for the university, I think Cardiff University or University of South Wales, or say, look, for argument's sake, one of the universities has taken over Land Rumney Fields and putting that, a new that's sports right, yeah, complex I saw there. The plans for that. that looks exciting. And it's, it's incredible. Brand new sports hall, hockey pitches, 3G, the whole lot. There is no cricket provision at all. No, no. Um, and I think if, you know, if, if, if cricket in Wales and Glamorgan and, you know, the universities in Wales are going to take it seriously, then there has to be that investment. I haven't seen it at Cardiff Met ever. Um, and I've been there since 96. I've never, I, they're involved with the university program, but I haven't seen them ever invest in the facilities. And that's no yeah, criticism true. of them. It's, it's fact. Um, and I just think that there just needs to be that investment in order for cricket to thrive a little bit more. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I totally agree. I mean, shifting it a little bit from cricket, we, we, you know, unfortunately you said about, you know, 19, 20 years with a, with the same company, um, with, you know, what, 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 you know, how does that, what happened and, you know, have you, what have you been doing the last few months to, to sort of, you know, what have you been up to the last few months? Um, I mean, it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, I think the first, <clears throat> when we were first locked down, which was sort of March, April time, um, yeah. and then homeschooling and all that sort of stuff. My wife's a teacher, so she was, you know, she was teaching. We were trying to juggle the homeschooling. Um, and then for me, over the summer holidays, I, I, I sort of gave myself permission to have the summer off. You know, the yeah. kids had six weeks off school. My wife had six weeks off school. And we just thought, you know what, this is almost like a sabbatical. We're never going to get this time back. Yeah. Um, so I didn't really put myself under any pressure to um, 
to look for work um because i thought you know what this is you know i've worked hard for 20 years i'm probably going to work hard for another 20 years yeah this six weeks off is okay I, I suppose since then it's been since then it's been more challenging you know yeah. particularly since the beginning of september um in what, way, what, in what way what sort of challenges have you, have you found i think i think there's a couple of things i think the reality of redundancy is um i think it's really it, it's tough it you know they always people always say you know it's not personal it's the position that's being made redundant not you ultimately yeah, yeah, yeah. you've worked for a company they don't want you anymore no. now and that's really once you sort of break it down like that it, it that's quite hard to um that's quite hard to take um and, you and think so i think the, that at the moment now how, how do you feel about that decision now then do you think you've accepted that more now than you have than you have i've been? accepted it yeah it, it i've accepted it but I suppose it was there was a couple of I suppose reality moments. One when I put it on Facebook um, that I'd been made redundant, and the the I suppose the flooding of comments that people had that was so positive. I was um, I was quite overwhelmed by it. Yeah, um, yeah, amazing. And you know, so that was a sort of reality check. That you you know, you told the world whether it was LinkedIn or Facebook um, that you'd been made redundant. Um, yeah. And it wasn't. It's, it's not something I'm. It's not something I'm embarrassed about in any way at all um but i think that that was the first point and then all those you know, people say the nice things you know we've spoken about it before now is that people say great things like you know oh, you'll be okay and mm -hmm. you know you'll snap up a job anytime soon and any company will be lucky to have you and all that sort of stuff and you're like yeah that's true but that's not that's not yeah, the reality yet, or, you know, yeah, no I totally I totally, and i think i totally have empathy for it as well you know and you, you, I think the problem, the the problem with the current situation, and, and I sort of use the analogy is that you you've kind of all been chucked into a swimming pool together. Yeah. Um, you're treading water, and sometimes it's really hard to see the way out. And particularly if you've never been there before, you know, do you go to recruitment companies? Do you uh, uh, go to companies direct do you go to the job center do you go you know how many how many different job sites can you and and to the start of it I, I found it quite overwhelming that you I didn't know where to start yeah you know you sat there you haven't got a job you've got to find a job now where do you start do you rewrite your cv do you go and do those things I mean one of the best things I did was get a professional company to rewrite my cv right that's um, interesting I'm, I'm you know, there's a company in um, in Cardiff, actually, in Sophia Walk, that um, they were with. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not a particularly braggy person. I don't, hey, I don't. You're a you're as modest a guy that I know, to be honest. <laughs> as guy you know, but the stuff that I've done with work's been pretty impressive over the years. Yeah. And actually, I needed. I I got on a phone call with this guy probably for about an hour. And he said, you know, and we started mapping out my job and he said, right, what were the best things you did there? What did you do there? What are you most proud of? And I probably spent an hour with him on the phone. And then about three or four days later, he sent through this CV and I read it and I was like, shit, that's, wow. that's pretty good. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you've, you, you've done well. And so that'd probably be my biggest piece of advice is that, you know, get your CV redone. Cause I think people are, most people aren't very good at, um, being proud of their achievements. Yeah. I think some do it I mean, probably better than we, others. We, we, we kick ourselves more than we, you know, the first person you put down is yourself, you know, mm. but actually what you need and like what you've just, in my opinion, what you've just said is you, you've just had someone to surround you to show you exactly, actually show you a bit of, you know, wood light at the end of the tunnel and then showing you the wood through the trees. It's, it's yeah. one of those ones that you need someone else to pat you on the back sometimes and, and actually Yes, you've done amazing things, but you never see that once you've got that blinker on, isn't it? Yeah, um, and I, you know, I think that was that was the first thing, and then secondly, asking for help, um, yeah. and that that comes in so many different um, so many different ways. Whether people say, you know, can I can I help in any way? And I'm like, yeah. Do you know what? If you know anyone in the medical industry, or do you know anyone in the pharmaceutical industry, or do you know anyone who does this? And I've, I've had dozens of people who've you know being in contact said you know you need to go and speak to him or you need to go and speak to that or i'll catch up with a coffee for you and i said so i think there's there's certainly that on a professional work level but but also on a personal level you know if you've got a network of friends around you and there's days that you do struggle um i think pe people are very willing to help 
Um, yeah. And that, again, that was quite overwhelming. The number of people who either put you in touch with someone or gave you a kind word or just wanted to support you in whatever way they could. Um, and some of them came to us like, right, is there anything I can do to help? Um, and sometimes it's like, yeah, can you, do you mind just looking after this? You know, whether it's the cricket club um, or whether it was with other things, people are more willing to help than I think than, than, than people take on board. But I think having that support bubble is probably a good term for it, that you've got different people in that support bubble who can support you in different ways. Um, and what would you, a lot what of the time. Say, I mean, you know, people sat there now. What would you say about, um, you know, obviously people keep them keep their feelings to themselves that won't necessarily feel like they can uh, reach out. I mean, obviously the success, I mean, I've had examples of that as well when I lost 29 Park Place and, you know, there, there's certain people that just came to my aid. I didn't ask for it. They just came to me. Um, and you do, you know, I, I resonate with what you said, that you, 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 people pull around you, you know, but ultimately I may be guilty of not asking for enough help. You know, what, what would you say to those people then regarding uh, people that are a bit worried about doing that? Um, I think be honest if people say, how are you? Yeah. You know, we're, we're all used to saying, yeah, we're fine. Um, and there's going to be times where you, where, do you know what? I think there's times where actually that's, that's okay to answer like that um, because you might not be in the mood to talk about what's going on, but Actually, you know, there's there's other people who ask you that and you say, do you know what? I'm struggling. Yeah. You know, I'm having a bad few days. I'm really finding this tough or whatever it is. But I think I think talking to people as much as possible, um, not broadcasting on social media. I don't I don't I don't really subscribe to that. I think no. you've got a trusted network of friends and, you know, talk to your wife, your partner. And I think as soon as you are sort of honest about stuff and, and I want to try and normalize all that stuff and, and not normalize it in the way that um it becomes irrelevant that's not what i mean I, th I think normalizing people talking about it that actually there are days that we struggle there are days that we feel really shit and low um yeah. and sometimes that can last for a couple of hours sometimes that can last for a day and sometimes that can last for a few days um yeah. and actually talking to people just to say whatever you know to you to my wife so i might say loose i just need to go for a walk yeah. um or listen i'm having a bad couple of days you know can we talk about it a little bit later or i need to go and catch up with so and so or it, and i think i think in particularly in this time i think everything's amplified so um and by that i mean particularly when you know when if you if you're not working in you're struggling a little bit with your mental health i think um i find this those wins seem really big um so when actually when you get something right or when you do something really well that can be really uplifting similarly the little things that you might get wrong now again can can knock you quite a lot yeah. um whereas perhaps in a better frame of mind you might be a bit more um a bit more reasonable in your reaction than not taking it quite so hard and i just i just think you know everything's everything's amplified and i think everything's amplified for everyone i think the kids struggle with it sometimes yeah, I agree. um I think we, I think we take in a family life, life. And, uh, i totally agree i think it is amplified in these environments so talk us through what you've done since then and how, how have you found how have you used that sort of crack on mantra then to, to, you know to get yourself out of that what have you done since to to move yourself out of that position um i think for me again it was working out what works yeah. um so you know trying to find those little windows that you know you've got the that you really get pleasure from or really sort of reset you as a, a person so you know i've just started doing yoga um Brilliant. and that's not that's not necessarily for the meditation side of things i've got you know there's a company up here the yoga hub yoga abilities run by you know alex donovan yeah, yeah, I've seen, I've seen it. I've seen Avatar. I, I, I do know her actually. Yeah, I mean that looks amazing. So when you just recently started that, have you? Yeah, so I do that about two or three times a week. They just take a different sort of slant on it, so it's less meditation. It's less. You can do that stuff, um, but I've just found you know, <laughs> getting to the age of things hurt a little bit more. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what Alex and we're not as flexible as we ever have been, to be honest. I think this is <laughs> the best thing any of us can do. But you, and so 
the sessions I've been to sort of half past six in the morning. So I go there, do it 45 minutes. By the time I get home, it's then getting the kids up, getting them to, um, to a breakfast club, getting to school, but presenting that routine that gets me up, gets me going. And it doesn't always work. Yeah. Um, but generally that sort of gives me a couple of things. So actually by the time I sort of, um, by nine o'clock comes, I've sorted the kids out, I've done my exercise. I've taken the dog for a walk. I've had breakfast. I've, you know, and I'm sort of teed up for the day. Um, and I don't think I could do that every day. Um, just because I don't want to get out of bed. You say you're quite a routine person. You know, you like, um, routine, like the way you do things like that. Do you think that, uh, that's, that's, you know, do you get the best out of yourself for that? Yes and no. I, I remember you did the, was it the 5 a.m. challenge or the yeah, 6 a.m. challenge? Yeah, I, 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 I really enjoyed it, actually. Do you uh, still do it? The only thing that stopped me from doing it was I got Sleep. back into work, you know, and I was doing nights, and, and that was the only yeah. reason I was getting back at three in the morning, and to try and get back up at five was actually, it was having a detrimental impact on my life, you know, but I could definitely do the 5 a.m. now. I've got friends that do it. They find it really... And I've got more, funny enough, when you talk, I asked you that question, maybe for myself as well, I'm more, um, I've always lacked organisation. Anyone who knows me knows that. Um, but I'm a lot, so much better the last year or so. And I've, I've got myself, like you just said, that, that routine you just said, I found the routine in that. I've just found that such a help. You know, I found that such a help going, uh, just get my, I feel like it's all ready for the day then when it comes to like nine, 10 o'clock, because I've done everything I need to do, you know? So what's your what's your routine now, John? I'm the same. What do you what do you what's your morning routine now then? So I funny enough, I and, and t- I, I just my boy's got a paper round, right? Um, Brilliant. And yes, Brilliant. I've always said if my boy ever had got a paper round, I'd never do it with him, right? But I just bought myself a little smart car, and, and I literally I get up at six o'clock at six o'clock, and I do this paper round with him. I've done it for the last month or two. And I've just found it. One is an hour with my boy every morning, right? And when, when they get to 14, 15, you know, everyone will vouch. That's a tough age to ever get hours worth of time with them because they, they don't want to be with you. But I use that as a real, as get up. I've got to get up with him because if I don't get up, he doesn't get up and he'll let the person down. So I get up, do yeah. my paper round. And then I come back, walk the dog, and then obviously take the kids to school. Um, and I've, had my, I've done three and a half thousand steps by then. And how I judge it now is right, I'm cool with that because three and a half thousand steps, four thousand steps is where I'm happy to be by nine o'clock. And then I'm ready, you know, and then, and, and, and then I just, you know, do a podcast or two and, you know, I, 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 I'm ready for the day. But yeah, that's what my morning looks like now. And I'm, 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 I'm really happy with that actually. It's working well for me. Yeah, I mean, going back, I think. It... Yeah, it, it, it's fine. It, I think it's finding out a routine that works for you. I don't think getting out of bed at quarter to six every morning would work for me yeah. currently, just with the way, you know, my, my wife's just set up a business, um, Rose and Wren. So she's, exciting, you know, she's not exciting. in peak. Really exciting. You know, so we, you know, I do my bats out stuff. Um, Lucy does a Rose and Wren stuff. Um, and yeah, we're, ju- we're just finding our, bu- our, our evenings are busier, but actually, you know, whereas probably two months ago, we'd sit down and watch a box set um, and go to bed. You know, we might watch one or two and then, you know, you go to bed pretty late and nothing really comes of it. And now, you know, she's set up a business, so she's doing a little bit of stuff on the side. I'm doing a little bit more with Bats Out as well. Yeah. Um, and actually, you know, there's there's evenings where we sat down in the kitchen. We're, you know, we're both on laptop, but actually we're finding those times. We're probably more we're probably more engaged with each other. So she's got an idea about stuff. She'll float that past me, vice versa. So we're probably more engaged with each other doing that than we are sat in front of a box set. Yeah, yeah, um, no, totally, I totally agree. I was going to ask you the question about bat set. So how's bat set cricket going? It, yeah, it's going all right, actually. So I I set it up two years ago. And the reason I did it was... So what is it? First of all, what is it? Because I, I know what it is, but for the listeners, what is bat yeah. set? It's um it's basically it, predominantly cricket bats and coaching aids. Um, but the key for me was to um, enable club cricketers to be able to get their hands on the best bats on the market. So yeah. um, I work with Keeley Cricket, who are based down in Sussex, um, and I've known the guys there for again best bats. part. I looked at your list the other day, and I said to my boy, "We are both having Keeley bats next year." 
Uh, yeah. But it is going to take me to do a few paper rounds within the get room, but I'll, I'm, <laughs> I'm on the paper rounds now, so I get my allowance. But I'm on a Keeley bat this year, definitely. No, I mean, so they make, I mean, you look at the England T20 side the other day, six of their players are using Keeley bats yeah. um, and sticking their own sponsors on them. Um, they just make incredible bats for, like, you know, they do Chris Gales, they're at Coley's. Um, you know, I can't mention too many of the England players, but they make some of the best bats in the world. And that was so when I first so two years ago, I need I needed a bat. All my I used to get loads of bats from my brother who played cricket for Sussex and England for again 15, 20 years. So I used to get the best bats off the likes of Matt Pryor and Mark um, Matt Pryor, Mike Yardy, those guys. Amazing. And then I had a few pros that I played, you know, like Mark Wallace, they got a bat off him. And then so basically all my mates started retiring getting too old to play cricket and I, my source of bats just dried up right. so um so I, so I think for the first two years ago I had to go and buy myself a bat which I hadn't wow, done for, that's for a, years that's a <laughs> um but the problem with Cardiff you know and in South Wales is that there's hardly any cricket retailers um and actually if you want to get your hands on a decent cricket bat it's pretty hard to do um yeah. And I don't think actually going on a website and just picking out a random bat is the way to go. So I set up a company. Um, so on my website, I itemize every single bat that we have. You get four or five pictures of it. It's the number, it's the weight, it's the number of grains, it's how it feels. There's a little description. So my idea is that, you know, if you can't come to a shop, um, then I'm trying to do the second best thing. Um, yeah. So if you want a bat that weighs £2.10 and you want more than 12 grains on it or whatever i've either got it or i'll go and get it for you um yeah, so i'm trying to sort of present great. almost I mean, like that's, a that's, thing is through adversity things come out mate you know and i i saw funny enough i saw the the feeder and i'm going to get one for jack i mean if he listens to this before it'd be a bit of a non-surprise but i am <laughs> going to get one of those for him because i can't you know i i, I do a lot of throwdowns for him but and people of cricket will understand that and that or a Throwing down to your son is, is, is quite tedious. But if I could just give him a ball that throws down to yeah. him, feeder, you'll love that. So I can't wait to get on there. I'm going to have one for Christmas for definite. So you've got one order from me. And two cricket bats as well, mate. So but you, there you go. you've identified a, 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 a need in the market, you know, and you've got at it, which, you know, part of that crack on mentality is exactly that, isn't it? But do, do you know what? I, I was doing, I put something on Facebook the other day, um, and actually, all this stuff's come out of adversity. So my wife set up, you know, Rose and Wren, um, yeah. which is incredible, you know, clothing boutique. She doesn't like the word boutique, but it's a sort of boutique, elegant clothing um, company. They do fab stuff. Um, you know, my cousin's just set up a um, cocktail delivery product. It's called yeah. Drink In. Um, so you can order your, um, yeah, all the porn star martinis, all that sort of stuff, and they'll deliver it to your door ready to go and all you need is ice and a glass and maybe a slice of lemon amazing and you've got your cocktails ready to go that gets delivered through your door you know i've got another cousin who set up a wine tasting um uh organization and it, it all these things have come probably come up through this covid crap um yeah. and it, yeah I, I just don't so i'm trying to look at it and think actually a lot of positive stuff's coming from this that wouldn't have otherwise happened um and, you know, I'm seeing, the, you know, these little companies just pop up all over the place and people just sort of starting up. They've been made redundant, you know, and, and reflecting on, particularly at our age, reflecting on what their passion is. Again, my best friend's wife has just set up a, you know, a cake making company um, in Hertfordshire. So they do right. birthday cakes and little Christmas bundles. Um, and she wouldn't have done, she got made redundant two, uh, two months ago and she wouldn't have set that up if it wasn't for this. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of stuff that's come from it that, I think probably in reflection, I think in five, 10 years time, I'll look back at this time and think, do you know what? I had that summer off with the kids. You know, we both set up our own companies. We did all this sort of stuff that we wouldn't have otherwise done. Um, and while it's quite tough to see the light now at times, I think in I think in five, 10 years time, I think we'd be quite proud of what we've done. Oh, mate, you should be, look, whatever happens, you should be massively proud of where you are now. And and like I said, we beat our, ourselves up. I look at myself and what I've done, and I think, well, I've got to do more of this, more of that. But actually, in reflection, when someone else tells you, like my brother came down the other day, my elder one, and he was talking to me about, well, you've done this, you've done that. And actually, you forget the, the impact you have. And, you know, I think uh, you will look in 10 years' time and look at that and think, what an amazing thing you've done. And 
So maybe we're going to wrap it up in a second. I've got one last question for you. And, and, and someone sat there back at home, listen to this, or they're, they're, they're on a run. And that that one bit of advice that you could give somebody, like you've got you've got up, you've set the bats out cricket, you, you know, you've got to pick yourself up and you're doing things, and that, that's amazing. What would you what bit one bit of advice would you give that person if they really wanted to crack on? You know, what 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 bit of what bit of gold golden nugget could you give them to 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 really you know impose themselves and get on with things? I think talk to people. Yeah. Um talk to be you know if you if you want to set something up in the industry um or in a particular industry go and talk to somebody who works in that industry and i think people are a lot more helpful than you think they are yeah. um or you think they will be um you know so if you want to go and open up a bar go and speak to someone who's opened up a bar or run a bar or a restaurant for years you know yeah. probably not a good time to do it now but it might not be a bad <laughs> time rent you know, on the other side it could be isn't it i mean as i yeah. say with his with his uh, chaos is opportunity and ultimately there will you know there could well be and you're right come and speak to me come and speak to people like that I totally agree with you you know that's a, that's a great bit of advice and I think just getting you know so I've done it with you know I want to get into orthopedic um, medical sales um, and the number of people that you sort of say you know do you know that surgeon do you know that and I say well I don't know that surgeon but I know that surgeon's PA yeah. and all of a sudden I'm speaking to you know, two of the leading orthopedic consultants in Cardiff, I'm speaking to his PA or to their PA, and I've got some, you know, theatre time, you know, booked in once, you know, COVID stuff releases. So I think go and talk to people, um, talk to people about what you want to do, how you want to go about it. And and people are really willing to help. Um, really, I mean, yeah, I've been, I've been quite overwhelmed with it. The number of people who will put time aside to catch up for a coffee or go for a walk around the lake something with you yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Just, yeah just I, 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 I just think i mean if someone i think that's great advice mate if anyone wants to contact dave Curdy, how's the best way to do that mate if anyone wanted to reach out to you what's the best way to contact you um you could do it through bats out so it's uh david at bats out cricket.co.uk i mean I'm, yeah. yeah we can put my number in the link on here um i just think talking to people i think you know as a as a as a population, I don't think we're very good at it. Um, and I just love to see people just being a bit more honest about how they're thinking, how they're feeling, what they want to do. And and I think once you've done that, I think if people find life a lot easier or, or, or realize that actually what you're feeling, other people are feeling the same. Um, yeah. And whether it's whether you've lost your job, whether it's, you know, you're searching for a hobby, whatever it is. Um, yeah, I think people would be pretty surprised how much their friends and their network and their bubble will be open to help them that's what i've found pretty pretty yeah, overwhelming yeah, at last. i 100 agree and, and and actually on that note when we when we end this because i am going to end this in a second well like whenever myself and my wife you know had a business we obviously had dead canary 29 you guys as a family one thing i'll always remember is the support you gave us um and that's an example of supporting each other and you know for that thank you because You've always, everything I've done, you've supported. And uh, this being another example of that. So I think this is just testament to the sort of person you are. Um, and actually, you're an absolute guy that does crack on. And I was, like I said, privileged to, to be able to talk to you, mate. And thank you very much for, for your time, mate. Have a, have a great day and uh, crack on. Thanks, bud. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, look after yourself, mate. Good luck with uh, the bats out. And I will be supporting you soon with that. I'll, uh, I'll be on that online uh, in a second. So anyway, have a great day. <laughs> You're a good man. Thanks, John. Take care. Cheers, mate. Bye-bye. Here we go. Episode six. Dave Kirtley. I uh, really enjoyed actually listening to that again. Uh, just, uh, just a really nice guy. Top bloke. Uh, done a lot. Like I said, I remember playing many a time the game of cricket against him. And uh, yeah, a really awesome batter. Great captain. And every time you went in for a game with Dave, you knew... You're in for a tussle. And the story we didn't really go through was that we were lucky enough to play midweek in the same team uh, club when I was back in Cardiff. And Dave batted with my son, Jack. And it, it was just really nice to see, you know, he coached him all the way through it. And just to, like I said, just a, an all round top guy. So thanks Dave for that. Uh, it was filmed prior to Christmas. So there's a lot, there's probably references within that that uh, you'll have to just make sure they are a bit out of date, but really good to catch up with him. So episode six done. So the next one after Dave, episode seven 
is the is Jason Dunlop, so the founder of My Life Data. Really interesting guy. Then, like for me, loads of different things that I I haven't done. Um, so you know, he's into data and really really interesting guy. So I'm really excited to bring that to everyone as well. So yeah, on to episode seven after this. Anyway, have a great week. Thanks, Dave, for everything you did. And if you've enjoyed it, subscribe and just give me some feedback. It'd be great for some feedback. I've had some really nice comments so far. So anyway, if you do have any feedback, give it me. Have a great day. Crack on. Crack on.